graduating. And her, her presentation is going to be on civilian identity. And I'll let her do the rest. Hi everyone, my name is Natalia Wachtuber and I come from Slovenia um, and my honors project would not be here today if I was in the um, Slovenian and living in the United States for the past five years and um, accumulate everything I learned uh, during my studies of um, international studies. Um, I would like to thank my mentor, Oscar Bielusa, and my committee members for all their help um, during this process. So the most common question or reply to when I studied that I'm from Slovenia from the Americans would be, oh, Eastern Europe, or yeah, those Balkans. <laughs> and that made me feel inferior. It made me feel like I'm lesser, and it really offended me. And because I don't carry a PowerPoint with me at all times to show them <laughs> that Slovenia does exist, and where it's located and where its neighbors, and give them some basic information that shows that Slovenia is a very civilized country, and we have electricity and things like that. And I don't carry the picture that shows how beautiful Slovenia is. This is why I always say, no, I'm not Eastern European, I'm not Balkan, I'm Central European. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> and I never questioned this until this past year when I read a book of Maria Tudorova, Imagining the Balkans. And that's when I asked myself, what does Central Europe even mean? Um, and why do I want to escape from the identity of being the Balkan if I love the people of the Balkans? So I asked this question, this is my research question, why are Slovenians so insistent on identifying themselves as Central Europeans? And my initial hypothesis was that this is the case because we want to distance ourselves from negative prejudices that the Western world has created about Eastern Europe and the Balkans, which is mostly the consequence of the communist division of the world, the East and the Western Bloc, and also because of the violent war that occurred in Yugoslavia. And this, my initial hypothesis, was clearly derived by theory of Orientalism. And I will explain you how, what Orientalism actually is. So theory of Orientalism was developed by Ebert Said, who's a Palestinian American scholar. And as a Palestinian who lived in the Middle East and later on in America, has observed that the depictions of Middle East are very far from the reality. And therefore, Orientalism is a term used for the imitation or depiction of aspects of Eastern cultures in the West by writers, designers, artists, in later centuries of the media, and so forth. These depictions are not realistic, as he said, and present the people of the Orient as completely different from the Westerners, so completely opposite from the civilized people. So his quote is, the Oriental is irrational, depraved, childlike, and different, because the European is rational, virtuous, mature, and moral. He also thinks that Orientalist depictions are not innocent or objective, but rather a result of a process that reflects the need to create and keep the superiority of the West. Therefore, if we believe that people in the Middle East are completely different than we are, that are irrational, that they are barbaric, it's going to be a lot easier for the government to achieve their goals than if we believe that they are just as good people as we are. And he also said that Orientalism not only shapes the Western perspective on the other, but also affects how Orientalized people perceive themselves. And I think the example of this is my country, Slovenia. So when I learned of this theory of Orientalism, I said, oh, this applies to Europe as well. It's not only the Middle East, it's also other parts of the world. And what I found through my research is that there are Orientalist discourses about Europe, and that Europe is divided in four different locations or geopolitical locations. So when we think of Eastern Europe, we think of backwardness. We think of the communist system and people that live in these gray, old cities. 
when we think of ba Balkans, we think of violence, especially because of the Balkan Wars in the early 19th century and later on Yugoslav Wars in the 1990s. When we think of Western Europe, we think of civilization, we think of all this great stuff. But when we think of Central Europe, it's a very vague, undefined term which lets the people to interpret the way they want. And how do we divide Europe in all these different locations? Where is the border? And now I would like to present to you a um, video of Slovenian philosopher uh, Slavoj Žižek who discusses this matter. Oh, and he's standing on a bridge in the uh, capital of Ljubljana above the biggest river in the city. And let's listen to him. Okay. We can begin. Yeah. Okay. Now, what you see here is, at least in summer or in the fall, one of the nicest views of Ljubljana. It looks like fair. Green leaves, etc. On both sides, nice old houses, nothing special. Eh, but you are wrong. This river here is the official geographical limit between Balkan and Middle Europa. So beware, on the other side, horror, oriental despotism, women get beaten, get raped and like it. On this side, Europe, civilization, women get beaten and raped but don't like it. So, Balkan, Middle Europa, don't forget it. Middle Europa was to more officially join them in a whole. 
and make them more competitive. But in just after World War One and especially in the 1930s, the idea got very perverted by Nazis. Um, they dreamed of a German Reich where everything would be turned into German. And the nations that before were able to live in good conditions in this area um, had to escape either to east and most of the countries uh, joined into Soviet Union which locked them down in a communist system while some of the nations uh, joined into Union of Southern Slavs in Yugoslavia which also then we know did not end really well. So this idea was evoked in 1980s by Czechoslovaks, Poles, Hungarians due to frustration with the Soviet system. And this nation started again dreaming of this united Europe where the nations would be able to preserve their nationality, would be respected, would be an independent state, and would be able to live and develop further on as they started in Austria-Hungarian Empire. Um, and also Slovenia joined this idea. So now we know that Central Europe is something that it was invented in the area and that countries used to escape from Eastern European or Balkan label. Here are some of the maps of where this United Europe was located. Already in 1600, the Holy Roman Empire with Habsburg monarchy and Austro-Hungarian Empire. So when I was doing this research, I found that there has been several periods of time when this identity of Central European was so important for Slovenians, and I found three major ones. The first one, claiming to be Central European was a method to define national identity and justify separation from the former Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. Slovenia claimed we have this historic connection to Central Europe, we were this industrialized country, and we don't belong in this union of sovereign slums. We are better than that. And we claim Central European, and we succeeded. In 1991, we separated from Yugoslavia without violent war. We escaped and we were able to develop further on. Then the second period began when our Central European identity claiming even strengthened. And this was when we wanted to join the European Union. And this was right from the beginning when we were an independent state. So this Central European identity was a label that showed Slovenia is European enough to become a member of the European Union, Union and NATO. And what I found is that what prevented us to become a full-fledged member earlier was not economy. Our economy was very strong already in Yugoslavia and in Australia because we had no war. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what was preventing us was our Balkan identity. People believe that we are politically unstable, just like all the Balkan nations are in the stereotypes of the West. And here is when my title plays in. Um, in my title, I said, from the sunny side of Alps to the green heart of Europe. And this shows how in every single perspective, we try to persuade the West that we are a Central European country. So we went from southern part sunny side of um, Alps, which refers to southern part of Alps, which refers to Balkans, to green heart of Europe, which refers to the center. And the last part of this uh, strengthening of Central European identity was rec uh, when we were recognized by Western political powers to be so. Um, we were admitted to European Union and NATO. And when this happened, uh, they started seeing us differently. And uh, the proof that I have for that is um, the World Factbook, CIM World Factbook, placed Slovenia in southeastern Europe in 1995. However, when you look at the same page now, you see that it's located in uh, South Central Europe. So all this has strengthened our identity of Central European. So with this research, I found several things. And I, first, I got the answer to my question, why? Am I so bond of this Central European identity? I don't know why I want to persuade everyone that this is the case. Um, and I already showed you all the results. And I am also a lot more critical of Slovenians claiming Central European because I know that with doing so, I'm victimizing other Balkan and Eastern European countries. What I should be doing is breaking those stereotypes, not enforcing them. 
I am also um, critical of this old-fashioned division of the world. In this age when we have technology and we can access information in a matter of seconds, we should not be just oversimplifying and dividing the world Eastern and Western, who is developed, who is not developed. I think by now we're pretty much very de developed all around the world. And this research, research it feels it's important for Slovenians, for other nations that went through the same process over the years, but also for the Westerns to alarm what their stereotypes are doing to the people and make them question everything they see in media and movies and actually go out there and access information. Thank you. And I would ask for some questions. What do you think was like the hardest part of like conducting your research, or was there ever a point where you wanted to like give up? Or anything like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I had to read a lot to get to all this information, and when I went in there in this research, I had those stereotypes myself, um, and I was saying, "Oh, but we are different. We are better. Like it makes sense." But when I started breaking it down and breaking my own beliefs with which I grew up. That was when I was like, whoa, what is happening here? So I think that was the, the hardest part. But um, I feel that what I found um, has a really strong ground and it's important um, to be heard. Did you notice any, <coughs> excuse me, did you notice any differences, like any generational differences? Um, yeah, the first thing when I started thinking about this, I asked my mom, uh, what do you think where Slovenia belongs to? And she's like, oh century to be and we're not those Balkans. Just go look down the border. Mm -hmm. um, so, because it has been connected with our national identity, I feel everyone that is a Slovenian will claim the same thing. Because we've been kind of persuading others, at the same time persuading ourselves that we are century to be. And I think the education and all these things have a lot to do with that as well. Um, so, if you're a Slovenian, you're probably doing the same thing, no matter the age. When do you plan on going with this? Do you plan on doing anything with this further? Um, I a lot of questions, further questions um, started to come up. Um, one was since European Union denied um, acceptance of Slovenia because of its Balkan identity, that makes me question the European Union accession problem, uh, process, um, how they define themselves and who they um, don't let in. Uh, which we see with Turkey struggling for several years of uh, getting in. Also, Croatia has very similar history to Slovenia and still haven't gotten in, but Slovenia has been there since 2004. And the other thing is um, how, find an answer how we can stop doing this, how we can break those stereotypes. And I feel this new generation of technology should be capable of doing this, but we have to raise the awareness of what kind of effects this has on people. Have you uh, met any uh, any other fellow, say, former Yugoslav people who who resist this idea, who think that uh, you know, if you, if you've talked with family or friends, or people who say, well, no, we really are Central European, or we or um, don't see themselves doing it to others? Um, definitely, people do believe that they are superior to the rest of the Balkans. I'm just wondering if you presented this to Croatians or Serbians, do you think they'd be receptive? I mean, obviously the victimized part, but the victimizer, say the Croatians, um, because I spent time in Croatia and seeing how they talk about Bosnia. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, I think <laughs> I would have to find an educated bunch <laughs> 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 that would actually be open for that kind of discussion. Um, I think probably um, a lot of people won't uh, accept that and admit that. It was even hard to admit for myself. Um, but some people probably would understand that. You spent time in Sarajevo last summer. Mm -hmm. Did these kinds of discussions come up there? Um, no, I haven't discussed that, but um, just being in Sarajevo and experience all different 
pictures. Um, and I really, I love it. it. It's something special, it's something that's worth admiring, um, and especially that maybe really wanting to break those stereotypes. Thank you very much. Uh